Good evening, everyone. Sorry for that uh, false alarm there. Uh, it's good to see you with us this evening for our evening worship and to those joining us online as well. Uh, we bid you a warm welcome. Uh, as we speak, there is a service taking place in Santiago in Chile. Uh, some of you will remember back in January, well, first Sunday in February, actually it was, we had a visitor in the parish, the Reverend Max, uh, all the way from Santiago. He was a deacon in the church, and he's been ordained at the moment to the priesthood or presbyter, depending on which language you want to use, which means that he's fully fledged uh, as, of, as of in about an hour's time. So, uh, so we'll be praying for Max during our service this evening as we were mentioning him here this morning in Holy Trinity. The announcements were on the screen, so I hope you had an opportunity to, to read through them. Uh, I'm not going to go over them all other than just to point out the prayer meeting which takes place on Wednesday evening at half past seven in the parish hall. As we gather to worship God this evening, we're going to sing together our opening hymn, What Gift of Grace is Jesus my Redeemer, yet not I, but through Christ in me.
So, beloved in Christ, we come together to offer to Almighty God our worship and praise and thanksgiving, to confess our sins and to receive God's forgiveness, to hear His holy word proclaimed, to bring before Him our needs and the needs of the world, and to pray that in the power of His Spirit we may serve Him and know the greatness of His love. And so let us kneel or sit as we confess our sins to God our Father. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed. Through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do, we are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, open our lips. O God, make speed to save us. And glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Our psalm this evening is Psalm 143, verses 1 to 11, reading them an alternate half verse. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and in your faithfulness give ear to my supplications. Enter not into judgment with your servant. For the enemy has pursued me, crushing my life to the ground. My spirit faints within me. I remember the time past. I muse upon all your deeds. I stretch out my hands to you. O Lord, make haste to answer me. My spirit fails me. Let me hear of your loving kindness in the morning, for in you I put my trust. Deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies. Teach me to do what pleases you, for you are my God. Revive me, O Lord, for your name's sake. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. So we're going to read together from God's Word, and we're reading this evening from Luke's Gospel, from Luke chapter 24, and we're beginning to read at verse 13, Luke chapter 24, beginning at the 13th verse. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. And one of them, named Clopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that has happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. 
We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, And he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. And there they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. This is the word of the Lord. We're going to sing together the hymn, Holy Spirit, Living Breath of God. standing, we reaffirm our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. The Lord be with you. And let us pray. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord. O Lord, save the King. Let your ministers be clothed with righteousness. O Lord, save your people. Give peace in our time, O Lord. O God, make clean our hearts within us. The collect of today, the second Sunday of Easter. Almighty Father, you have given your only Son to die for our sins and to rise again for our justification. Grant us so to put away the leaven of malice and wickedness that we may always serve you in pureness of living and truth through the merits of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We say together, lighten our darkness. O Lord, we pray, and in your great mercy, defend us from all perils and dangers of this night for the love of your only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen as we continue in prayer. Almighty and eternal God, we give you thanks that as people of resurrection, we celebrate the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for that victory that he won for us, for the triumph over death and over the grave. We thank you that he has promised that by his Spirit he is with us now and that when we pray in his name, when we meet in his name, when we gather together as church in his name, he is here in the midst of us. We thank you that he has promised that when we make our prayers and supplications in his name, you will hear our prayers. We bless you, Father, for the generosity that you have shown to us, for the love poured out for us upon that cross, and for the promise of new life for when we place our faith and trust in you. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we thank you for your church, for this worldwide organization of which we are members in corporate We thank you that you have entrusted to your church the responsibility of proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ throughout the world. We thank you for Jesus and for the message that he gives, for the hope, the assurance, the certainty that we receive in him. Help your church to always remain faithful to its call to faithfully proclaim the gospel. The message of salvation is handed from generation to generation. The message that is portrayed in Scripture. Father, help us to never deviate from it and to put our own slant on it, but to think only of your ways. 
as we pray for your church. Today, Lord, we do pray for the Anglican Church in the West Indies. We thank you for the church in this land, and we pray for the Diocese of Armagh. We pray for Archbishop John. We pray for the clergy and people of that diocese, and in particular, Lord, we pray for the parish of Woods Chapel as they grieve and mourn the passing of their much-loved rector. We pray, Lord, for our own diocese, for Bishop David. We thank you for him, for his leadership, for his wisdom, for his guidance. We thank you for the call that you have placed on his life. And within our diocese today, Lord, we pray for the parish of Donachadi. We pray for their rector, the Reverend Gamble. And in our mission focus today, Lord, we pray for open doors and for the work that it does with the persecuted church. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we pray for those who are being ordained, for those preparing for ordination later this year in the Church of Ireland. But in particular, Father, we pray for the church in Chile and for the Diocese of Santiago, our linked diocese. And Father, we pray for those who are being ordained as priests. In particular, we remember before you Max we thank you for his ministry amongst us in February. We pray that your Holy Spirit would fall upon him as he makes the solemn vows and promises to serve you with his whole life. Be with his wife, Caro, and be with their children as they take on the responsibilities being bestowed upon them this day. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for our own parish, for every home and family in it. We pray especially today for those parishioners who live in Ballylock Road. We pray for the ministry and leadership of this church. We pray that you would bless the ministry steering group, the church wardens, the select vestry, the glebe wardens, and all who are appointed and elected to serve you in this place. May we keep the gospel principles at the fore of our minds, and may it be center in every decision that we make that your kingdom may be advanced here amongst us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, Father, for those who are ill, at home or in hospital, known and unknown to us, we ask, dear Lord, that you would bless them in their time of need, that they would be aware of your presence and your healing hand resting upon them. We pray, Father, for those who are bereaved, for those who are sad because loved ones are no longer with us. We pray, Lord, that you would comfort those who are bereaved in their time of need, that they would be aware of your presence surrounding them and uplifting them and holding them tight as they come to terms with the passing of loved ones. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And finally, Lord, we pray for this whole community, for these villages of Waringstown, Donaclone, and the surrounding areas. We pray that your Shekinah glory would fall on each family on each street, in every business, in every school, in every church. We pray for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit as has been seen in days of old and that that fire would burn and, grow and glow bright in all our lives. We pray that you would draw your church and this community to repentance, that you'd help us to seek the forgiveness of sins, of the wrongs that we've done, and that you would move amongst us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
And in a moment of stillness and quietness, we bring before God our own prayers and our own requests, and we lay them at his throne of grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, you have called us in this parish to be bearers of good news. Send your light and truth to lead us. Open our minds to worship you in spirit and in truth. Open our eyes to the opportunities you give us. Open our ears to hear your call. Open our hearts to your love that we may serve you and bring others to your light. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And let us bless one another with the words of the grace. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. We're going to sing together our gradual hymn, When Peace Like a River Attendeth My Way.
Let's just pray together. Father, we thank you for those uh, wonderful words that we've just been singing and how that we can sing, it is well, it is well with my soul. We thank you, Lord, for what you have done for us to enable those words to ring true. And as we've sang, but Lord, tis for thee, for thy coming we wait. Father, we pray that you would write that on each of our hearts. And now as we approach your word, we pray that you would give us a fresh understanding of it that you would help us to see the truths contained within each line, and that, Father, as we contemplate that Emmaus road, that each of us on our journey would be drawn closer to you. We pray that you would come and convict us where we need convicting, that you'd convince us where we need convincing, and ultimately that you would convert us where there needs to be conversion. Come, Holy Spirit, and work amongst us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you have a Bible near you and you want to open it at this evening's passage, uh, we are looking at Luke chapter 24, the road to Emmaus, and how that it is uh, that journey that two of the disciples found themselves on and the encounter that they had with Jesus while on it. Uh, This is still Easter Sunday in scriptural terms, in, in time frame. Uh, It's still last Sunday in our calendar as such, but news about Jesus having been raised from the dead is starting to spread across the whole of Jerusalem and no doubt into the uh, wider world as those, as we thought about this morning, Chinese whispers uh, kicked in as one person told another and told another and told uh, another. As As you know, I grew up in Castle Dawson, And uh, for those who don't know where Castle Dawson is, look at a map of Northern Ireland, find that big blue blob in the middle of it, which is known as Loch Ney, even though sometimes it's greeny color when you look at it, but it's blue on a map. And go to the top left-hand corner of it, and you'll find Mark Rafelt, and just the tiniest wee bit to the north of Mark Rafelt, you find Castle Dawson, where I grew up. And Castle Dawson is one of those villages, I suppose, not unlike Waringstown, not unlike Donna Cloney, where it's quite a close-knit community where nearly everybody knows everybody. Or, and if you don't know the person, you're going to know somebody that's connected to them. That's maybe just a trait of Northern Ireland in itself. It has that village feel about it. And as you walk down the street, or certainly it was uh, when I lived at home uh, 20 years ago, when you walk down the street, everybody knew each other and everybody said, good morning or afternoon, hello. Even you didn't really know the person. There was always some sort of an acknowledgement there. But they used to say about Castle Dawson that whenever a story started at the bottom of the village, by the time it got the length of the Presbyterian church was at the top of the village, nothing to do with the Presbyterians by any means. But when it got to the top of the village, it, had, uh, it hadn't got any smaller. An expression that I used this morning uh, was that when it started at one end of the village as a feather, by the time it got to the top end, it was a, a hen. And by the time it had made its way back down the village again, it was an ostrich, uh, that it was totally unrecognizable. Well, that's kind of what was happening on that first Easter day in Jerusalem. The story of Jesus having been raised from the dead was spreading. His body's missing. Where is he at? And you had this small group of disciples listening to the story of Mary Magdalene and of Peter, of course, who had already encountered the Lord, saying, He's raised from the dead. We've seen him. He's in human form. It's not a spirit. It's not a ghost. It's not make-believe. We're not hallucinating. We haven't been so overcome by grief that we're actually seeing things. He is risen. He's very much alive. We have saw him in the flesh. And as we thought about this morning, there was some of the disciples who were choosing not to believe it. And you could understand why they were choosing not to believe it. Because if you had saw someone being crucified, then you would know they're dead. There's no coming back from it. It's uh, physically and biologically and medically impossible for anyone to come back to life again 
after they have been crucified. And so you can understand their kind of approach to it and the approach of Thomas that we thought about this morning and how that he doubted those uh, statements that were being made. And then we fast forward a few hours, and it's evening time. It's around sort of five o'clock. It's before meal time, and then Israel meals would often be at sort of around half past seven, eight o'clock in the evening, and the whole family sit down together around the table, and they share in a feast together. It's just after the Passover, so there would have been surplus foods needing to be used up. I suppose in some way you could akin it to our Boxing Day where you're still eating turkey the day after Boxing Day and you're still eating it. You get to New Year's Day and you're fed up with it and it's in the freezer and you're pulling it out just to use it up. Well, that's the kind of way that it would have been. And two of the disciples decide that they go out for a walk. They were going to a village, we're told in verse, uh, in verse 13, which is where we pick up tonight's reading, to a village called Emmaus which is about seven miles from Jerusalem. Now, seven miles to you and me doesn't seem overly far. It's like getting in the car here and probably going to the outlet at, St at Banbridge. It's, what, six miles to Banbridge, and they'd add on that little bit extra uh, down the road. And they're not going a huge distance when you've got a motor vehicle. But in Jesus' day, the motor vehicles didn't exist. There was no cars. There was no wheels. No engine was walking or on the back of a donkey or a horse. So seven miles was a fair distance for someone to go for a dander, to go for a walk. And yet we're told that that's what they were doing. They were on their way to the village of Emmaus. They were going there. And they were talking to each other. And you can just imagine the sort of conversations they were having. Every single one of us in this church this evening at some stage or another will have experienced a bereavement. We'll all have seen loved ones taken from us, called to the nearer presence of the Lord. And we know the conversations that take place in and around a wake and in a funeral and in the days and weeks that follow that. You talk about the person. You talk about the things that they did, the things that made you smile. You reminisce about the stories that you've told hundreds of times over the space of three days in, in our culture. Well, this is what the disciples would have been doing. Do you remember in Galilee, he said this? Do you remember at Cana? He took the water and he turned it into wine. Like they had seven miles to walk. It wasn't a two-minute journey. Do you remember sitting on that mountainside, listening to him saying, blessed are the peacemakers? Do you remember when he said to us that he was going to die? But sure, what did he do wrong? You can just imagine the conversations that they were having. And Luke is drawing us into that the sort of normal, everyday conversations that you and I would be having had we have been there. How did what happened on Friday happen? Thursday night, we were eating a meal together. But do you remember what he said about the bread and the wine? And now it makes sense, huh? That Judas, hmm. did you see what he did? He allowed Jesus to wash his feet and then betrayed him with a kiss. Hey, where's he at now? You can just imagine. And then they tell us his body's not there. I bet you it's them Jewish authorities trying to make a mockery of us. They just hadn't put two and two together. They had seven miles to have these conversations. They probably played it over and over and over again in their minds as they talked. And they discussed, we're told in verse 15, these things with each other. And then someone comes up amongst them, comes beside them. You can just imagine the two disciples are walking along. They're sad. They're talking about the crucifixion. They're talking about what had them. And this man comes up to them and he looks at them and he says, 
What's wrong with you? Cost you nothing to smile. And they look at him, not realizing it was Jesus, and Luke tells us what happens. And they say to him, Have you not heard what has happened? We have just been talking about it for three and a half miles. Have you not heard? Have you not been in Jerusalem? How could you not know? You know, when we put it into our own context, that would have been like someone being in London in September 2022. Yes, I'm trying to get my dates right. When Queen Elizabeth died. And then walking down the street after the funeral and seeing all the rubbish lying and, you know, seeing all the guards going back to their barracks and stopping somebody and saying, what happened here today? Have you not heard? The queen died. What? Who? It's this sort of, what's what it's like? News of Jesus' death spread. Now, there were hundreds of people being crucified in Jerusalem. But Jesus' death was unique. He was innocent. And the crowds were calling for it. So it wasn't just as if one man stood in front of Pontius Pilate, in front of the judge, and Pilate said, you did wrong, away you go, you're being crucified. Hundreds and hundreds of people heard about it. So how has this man who has walked up beside the disciples not heard about it? What things, verse 19, were told Jesus asked? And they said about Jesus of Nazareth. And they'd say exactly what happened. Read it for yourselves. He was a prophet, powerful in word, and in deed, before God and all people. They're saying he was a good, honest, righteous man. But they just don't get who he was. Because look at what they then say. The chief priests and the rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death. They crucified him. But, verse 21, we had hoped that he would be the one who was going to redeem Israel. We had hoped. So they had lost faith. They were questioning even the three years that they had followed Jesus and everything that he said to them. They were questioning everything that they knew to be true. Fast forward. We could spend all evening looking at the passage, but fast forward. Verse 28. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus was going to walk on. So they had got to a mess. The seven mile was over. And Jesus was going to walk on and leave them. And Luke tells us that they begged him. They said, Stay. It's getting late in the evening. Come and have something to eat with us. Have a little bit of hospitality. And so Jesus went to where they were staying with them. When they was at table with them, look at the imagery that Luke describes. Verse 30, he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and he began to give it to them. What are we seeing before us? This is not the Sabbath. This is not the Friday night, Saturday afternoon meal. Because it's not uncommon in the Sabbath meal for Jewish families to sit together around a table and for the head of the household, whether it's the father or the mother, to take bread and to give thanks and to break it and to share it. It's part of their custom. It's what they do even to today. You go to a Jewish home on the Sabbath, and they do it. They take bread, and they say, Blessed art thou, O Lord, the God of our fathers. We have this bread to offer, work of human hands, and fruit of the earth that will become to us our spiritual food. They take it, they break it, they give thanks, and they share it. But there's something different in this. Firstly, it's not Friday night. It's not Saturday. It's not the Sabbath. It's, mon- it's Sunday, Sunday night. And Jesus does it. In verse 31, their eyes are opened. He has, in essence, shared with them the second time that communion is recorded in Luke's gospel. Because four days earlier, he's sitting with them at table in that upper room in Jerusalem. He takes bread, he breaks it, he gives thanks, he gives it to them, and he says, take and eat this in remembrance of me. 
And Emmaus, he takes the bread. He gives thanks. He breaks it, and he gives it to them. And immediately, verse 31, their eyes are opened, and they recognize him. Immediately, in the breaking of bread, they recognize the Lord. Now, if this was communion tonight, the symbolism of this is powerful because do we recognize Jesus in the breaking of bread? When we come forward to receive the bread and wine at Holy Communion, whether it's at the, st- the chancel steps or whether it's at the communion rails or whether it's at the back door or whether it's on a beach on Easter Sunday morning or at the top of a mountain or whether it's in a battlefield in France during one of the wars or whether it's in Ukraine in, in an army camp, wherever it happens to be that you're breaking bread, are you recognizing Jesus in it? The bread at no time changes. We do not acknowledge transubstantiation. It's always bread, whether it's sun-blessed or mother's pride or ormo or whatever it happens to be that Alan or Kathy have in their cupboards on a Sunday morning. It's bread. But the symbolism behind it is so, so powerful. And whenever we take that bread and eat it, whenever we take that cup and drink it, we remember the Lord's death until He returns. We pray that in our prayers. But are we like the disciples? Are our eyes being opened to who He actually is? The crucified, the buried, the risen, the ascended, the glorified, the promise to return Messiah. In this moment, Jesus counteracts everything that they've said in verse 21. Verse 21, we had hoped that he was the Messiah, the one who was going to redeem Israel. And in verse 31, they recognize that he is. He is the Savior of the world, the one who actually is redeeming the people of Israel and beyond. As we read in the Noctimedus, the light to reveal you to the Gentiles and to thy people Israel. We're told that they got up at once and returned to Jerusalem. Whatever length of time it took them to walk the seven miles to Emmaus, I bet you they did it in half the time going back. They could not wait to get back to tell the other disciples. They went to those those other disciples, nine of them, 11 in total. They went, went into that room and they seen them sitting there, and Peter and James and John and Matthew and all the others. And they looked and they would have saw Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Clopas, and Mary, the mother of Jesus. We would have saw them all gathered together. And they're looking at them and saying, we've seen him. We've seen him on the road to Emmaus. We've seen him. He walked with us. He talked with us. He ate with us. We've seen him. And instantly Jesus appears. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And as a church, we believe by his spirit, he is with us now. But do we actually believe it? That as we gather in this upper room, that Jesus is with us now? Do we believe it? Thank you, somebody does, good. And look at their response. The end of verse, in verse 32, were not our hearts burning within us while we talked with us on that road and opened the scriptures to us? Were not our hearts burning within us? Here's a question for you in finishing. Whenever you encounter the risen Lord, whether it's in Holy Communion, whether it's just in public worship, whether it's in private devotions at home and the reading of Scripture and in prayer, whether it's in your own quiet times, whether it's out walking the streets of Waringstown or Donna Cloney or wherever it is you happen to walk, when you encounter Jesus, does your heart burn within you? Is your heart, to use those wonderful words, hearts burning within us while he talked with us, while he walked with us, while he carries us along life's road? Our hearts should be filled. Our hearts should be strangely warmed when we encounter the risen Jesus. 
because it is the risen Jesus who gives us life, who gives us hope, who gives us assurance, who gives us certainty, who tells us, you've got a future. Just believe. Just believe. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that as you walked with those disciples on the road to Emmaus, you opened the scriptures and explained it to them, but then you met with them in the breaking of bread and they realized who you were. Lord, we ask that you would walk with us, that you would talk with us, that you would enlighten us through your word and that our hearts would be burning with fire with the love that you have for us as we realize who you are. For we pray this in your name and for your sake. Amen. We're going to sing together our final hymn, which is Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken. Got there in the end. I think I need to practice that one a bit more. It's the German national anthem, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's a good job I'm not German. Anyway, as we stand, we pray. And now into God's grace, God's mercy, and God's protection, we commit you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace this day and forevermore. Amen. So go in the peace of the risen Christ. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah.